Good morning, Facebook. Hello, everybody. It is Thursday morning. What is today? The 13th, the 14th. Thursday, the 14th, about 10 o'clock if you're watching live. And um, I want to talk about what makes a good wine list at a restaurant. Um, so I'm going to talk about my personal feelings and beliefs and opinions and why I feel that, um, why I feel that my um, approach is super important. Uh, let's see. So before I get started on all that, um, we are doing our ribeye special all week long. It's $9.99 to go. <clears throat> that goes until Sunday. And then uh, tonight is $9.99 burger night. And Sunday we have a great another $9.99 special, but our, our ribeye special is what's uh, crushing it all week long. Every week we do this an amazing $9.99 special that, um, that we sell a couple hundred of them. And uh, these are to-go specials only. You can eat them in-house, but they are a different price. And I just explained the price differences because if you take it home, I don't have to clean up after you. I don't have to serve you on my, serve on my food, on my china, on our plates. I don't have to wash your plates. I don't have to clean up after you. I don't have to have a staff there. So it's we can give discounts if you're taking out to-go food. It's simple as that. I have less resources in it, financial resources. So we pass those savings on to you every week with these amazing, amazing specials. So... Good morning, everybody who's tuning in. If you can just drop a comment, hashtag live, that would be fantastic. Um, the more comments you make, the more people see this. And I think today is an important topic because uh, today's talking about our personal philosophy, our business philosophy on wines, buying wines. And um, I, a lot of times other people say to me, oh, you have to try this restaurant out. This restaurant has such a great wine list. Um, you know, this... I hear that all the time from people. This restaurant has a great wine list. And I get to the restaurant and I look at the wine list. I'm like, I wouldn't drink much here right now. Like nothing here is, is interesting. Nothing here is from a real family winery. Nothing's from a small company. These are all massive, massive brands. Uh, more than ever right now, it's super important to support independent companies, local companies, uh, and know where your money's going. These massive faceless corporations like Diageo and Constellation don't need our money. Um, Diageo was, until three years ago, the largest uh, distillery spirit company out there. And then the Chinese company overtook their status in 2017. I've never even heard of this Chinese company. But they're larger than Diageo. Um, Diageo is such a large player. They own Guinness. They own a lot of the, the single malt whiskeys. They own a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll go over that. Um, and they own a lot of wines, too. A lot of wines. Constellation owns a lot of wines. Um, Gallo owns a lot of wineries. I'm going I'm to talk about this. So before I talk about more, those specific things, I'm going I'm to talk to you how purchasing wine in New York, New York works for restaurants. So there's when we first opened in 2003, 2004, there were probably five companies that were the main players in New York, like Eber Brothers, um, Colony, um, there's a few others in there. There's a few others in there. There's about four or five main players. And what happened, what happened was in New York, in a lot of states like this, only one person can carry Johnny Walker. Only one person can carry Mondavi. Only one person can carry Behringer. And that's yours. You have 100% rights of that in your area, in the state, whatever, whatever your area is. And nobody has that product, so they don't compete against you. So there's no, there's no need to lower your price and be competitive uh, with the other distributor who has a product. Now, in the restaurant industry, that's a total opposite with meat, with produce, with fish, with olive oil. Anybody can carry a lot of these same, same exact brands and be very competitive. So, um, thank you everybody for tuning in. Hi, Michelle. Michelle is on one of my other lives on the Ellenville Group. Hi, Ralph. Good morning. Um, hi, Sal. Good morning, everybody. So, when it comes to spirits and wine and liquor, liquor in New York, um, as a restaurant owner, I have one choice for that brand, and that's it. And I have to accept their price. And there's no negotiating. I can't be like, oh, this. Every price is posted with the state. The only thing I, the only way I can get a product cheaper, more cost effective, is if I buy more cases. So, for example, I've said this a lot. Like, bottle. If I buy one case or one bottle of a certain wine, it might be $12. Well, if they take it out of the box, they charge me a split charge. Some companies up to $2 per bottle. So if I'm a small restaurant, I only need three bottles of something. 
I could be paying up to $14 a bottle if I buy one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bottles. If I buy the full case and I'm paying 12, but the list price is 12, the split charge is more. So 12 to $14. If I buy the case, it's 12. If I buy two cases, it could be 1133. If I buy three, it could be 10 something. If I buy five cases, it could come down to eight, $9 a bottle. So let's say if I bought five cases of that wine, because there's volume discounts, five cases and, or three bottles, I'm going to be paying $8 versus $14. So it's a game they play. They want you to buy more. And they're making a ton of money on the $14 bottle. And they're still making a healthy margin on the $8 bottle in five cases. They're still making a very healthy margin. So a small restaurant like myself or any of the other small restaurants, when they buy wines by the bottle like that, they pay these sometimes astronomical prices. The liquor store down the road buys five cases, and then you go to the restaurant and you wonder why they're charging um, $40 for that bottle of wine, and the liquor store has that bottle of wine for $11.99. The liquor store is already making four bucks, which is a nice profit on that, on that wine. They're making four bucks a bottle. Um, the restaurant's trying to mark things up three times, so maybe they're charging 36, um, 49 or something, because uh, that's, that's a normal markup for a bottle of wine in a restaurant. So um, you go to the restaurant, you'll be like, well, that's, that's not good. I'm, I'm getting ripped off at this restaurant. Now, the small wineries don't do that. The small wineries, typically the price is a price on one case. Like we're buying a bunch of Movia wines. Again, we have to restock all of our Movia wines from Slovenia. And the price is a price. Whether we buy one bottle, one case, or five cases, it's the same exact price. They don't do the pricing, this pricing game to make you buy more. So we tend to buy wines that come from in those kind of structures where there's no big price advantage and nobody can outprice us. The price is the price. Um, so, or, the, or it's a very small discount if you buy more. And believe me, um, we've been able to buy more wine this year and get better discounts because we're not splitting cases. Most companies that you, we buy from that in New York State, as soon as they open the case and they pull the bottle out, it's an extra charge. And that bar charge can be literally up to 10% of the bottle. If you're buying, if you're buying a $78 bottle, $10 bottle, you're paying these split charges that are 10% or more. It doesn't make sense to buy three bottles of an $8 bottle, you just buy the whole case. But still, these split charges add up like crazy. And then, so now in New York, you had five companies 20 years ago. Southern Wine and Spirits came into the state. They bought a distributor out. They bought Letchers out, which was a, a distributor. They bought Letchers. Southern Wine and Spirits. They were the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the country for distributing wine. They came into the state. They bought Letchers. And they immediately, because they have relationships with Diageo, Constellation, um, Gallo, all these other companies in all these other states, they can now basically put a stronghold on these companies and say, hey, we have you in Arizona, California, Texas, Georgia, Florida, Colorado. You know, they'll list off like 12 states. We already have you in 12 states, Johnny Walker. So you're with this other company. So now if you want to keep doing business with you, you got to jump on ship with us. So all of these big brands from 20 years ago that were between these four or five major bigger companies in New York jumped ship. Uh, Some Belt Charmer was one of the other companies. They jumped ship from all these other family run distributors. And now they, Southern changed their name from Letchers to Southern, Southern Wine and Spirits in New York. And they were able to start robbing brands left and right. Well, Eber fell apart, Eber went, went broke. Um, there's a lot of companies, these big companies that family run companies that just went broke because they don't have products to sell anymore because their brands are gone. They can't compete with Southern. From there, the other couple companies that sort of had a sort of were like, well, we can still keep this portfolio. They started merging. They started merging and getting taken over. So New York is basically a two distributor game right now. Most restaurants, in fact, I think be probably all restaurants, 99% of restaurants in New York State buy from Southern Glazer, which is Southern Wine and Spirits, Southern Glazer, or Empire Merchants. Those are the two big players in the state. The other semi-bigger distributors went out of business or merged. As a result, you have a lot of small distributors that don't carry any of the recognizable brands whatsoever. They just don't carry them um, because they, they just don't. Um... How's it going? Good. Ace? Yep, you can come on in and drop it off in here. Jamie, if you're watching, um, 
we have a delivery here. So um, I don't know if Jamie is watching. I can't text her because I'm on my phone. So let's see if I can call her. Jamie's in the office right now. Jamie, if you're watching, we have a delivery here, and I'm on, and I'm on live, so oh, I can't even call her through here. So that's not working. Uh, one, one, one. Maybe I can send her a message on Facebook. Sorry for the interruption, folks. That for me, this isn't working. Oh, there we go. I didn't press send. In just one moment, folks, and I will be right back. So, oh, she's here. Good, 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 good. All right. Okay. So back to this whole premise of we dropped off all these distributors. There's two main companies. As a result, some other companies were able to. Um, there, don't get me wrong, there's 100, 200 distributors in New York State for wine and beer, uh, for wine, spirits, beer. There's a lot of companies, but there's all these small companies. So literally when we get the Southern book, the Southern rep doesn't even show up here anymore. We don't even have a Southern rep. Um, the books are this big. The books are this big. The, all the other companies, the books are five pages, 10 pages, very small, 30 pages. They're smaller companies. Some of these other smaller companies actually merged like Winebow and Martin Scott merged, um, and now they're in several states as well because they just these companies merged to get more power to fight against Southern Glazer, Southern Wine and Spirits. They, Southern Wine and Spirits is one who, by the way, who puts on the um, Miami South South Beach Food and Wine Festival. They're the ones who put that on. So this company is just massive, and they're like in now like 30, 40 states. Sorry. Is that correct? That's what you ordered. You wanted the other one. I right? wanted the burger. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. No, I didn't order that. So, um, so okay. So back to sorry about this. Um, so back to what makes a good wine list. So these two big companies, Southern, especially Southern, Southern Glazer, this big company that's in forty states across the country, thirty-five states across the country. They're only interested in buying big brands and selling big brands because for them, they don't want to buy a mom and pop, um, distribute a mom and pop independently run winery that only makes 50,000 cases, 100,000 cases, even a half a million because they're interested in mass distribution. It's like Walmart. They're the Walmart of the wine world. They're interested in mass distribution. So when they buy a brand, when they bring a brand in, they want to make sure they can cover as many states as possible with this brand. So the winery needs to be making a couple million bottles of wine. It needs to be a big brand of wine. So, because every restaurant buys from Southern, these are the wines that are bought by bought the most by restaurants. So when somebody says to me, oh, you've got to try this restaurant, their wine list is amazing, I will, I'll be the judge for myself on that. And it just recently happened to me. Somebody says, you've got to try this one restaurant, their wines are amazing. And I said, okay. So went there, had dinner. There was one bottle of wine that popped out and it was, it was a nice bottle at the time, but it was an old vintage. I didn't realize that until it came to the table. All the other brands were Ravenswood, Hogue Cellars, Barefoot type, all these. And even some, some of the stuff is in disguise. Miomi is a big brand, really big brand. So we ordered this wine. I'm like, you know what? It's past its prime, but what else, what else are we going to drink? You know, there's not really many other things on this list that are truly independent. And this restaurant had bought this brand probably five, six years ago. Couldn't sell it because nobody knew what it was because when you put it up against Ravenswood and you put it up against Claude Bois and you put it up against Kendall Jackson, us consumers, most consumers know those brands and they'll skip a small little Italian family-run vineyard for a big brand like Claude Bois. So that's exactly what happened at this restaurant. We drank the wine. It was okay. But... I'm gonna, I posted something on our Facebook last week of how um, Constellation Brands just bought all this stuff. Let's see the exact title of this. Some well-known wines are under new ownership as, oh, is uh, Ernest and Giulio Gallo acquire over, thir over 30 brands from Constellation for 800 and something million dollars. Um, so for me, a good wine list, for us a good wine list is when a restaurant is buying from 
true independence, interesting wines, and um, they're supporting real business that are run on a real economy. When you have so much volume, when you produce a massive amount of wine, massive amount of any product, you just, there's, there's no, uh, you cut corners, you cut corners, you typically disregard the community, um, you disregard the employees, um, everything to you is all, it's a numbers game now. So when you go to Southern Wine and Spirits, Southern Glazer, when you go to them, you've got to make sure, because they're going to beat you up too, and they're not going to pay you on time. So you've got to make sure that you're just mass producing, being super efficient, and that means cutting corners, using cheaper quality. Um, and some of these wines are really nice wines, and they, they get great ratings. But they would be that much better if they were family run still, and under small ownership, and the love and the passion were there doing everything right. All right, so... Ernest and Julio Gallo Winery and Constellation Brands are two of America's largest wine companies. Wine, Constellation, nobody knows Constellation by its name because it's just the, the parent company. Um, they are so big that companies themselves probably don't matter to most consumers. And you would never go buy like a Gallo, not really typically a Gallo wine. You would be like, oh, I'm gonna go buy a bottle of Gallo. You know, you think of a jug. No, no, Gallo owns a lot of, a lot of brands you'd recognize. Uh, more likely, you know them by the individual brand names under the umbrellas. Gallo for names like Barefoot, Dark Horse, Apothic, Constellation from Mandavi, Charles Smith, and even Kim Crawford. Um, so why does it matter if Constellation sells over 30 of its brands to Gallo for $810 million? Um, it was officially announced a couple weeks ago, one of uh, America's largest wine deals ever, taking nearly two years of wrangling with regulators to receive approval. The sale of this historical uh, of this sale has historical significance and can potentially set off alarms about consolidation in the wine industry. But for consumers, in short terms, you probably won't notice any differences at all. Uh, the sale includes plenty of well-known wines from standbys like Ravenswood, Mark West, uh, to Box Specialist Black Box, to even kosher wines, um, Manischewitz. Other brands to mention are Arbor Mist, Clos de Bois, Estancia, uh, France, Fr Francian, Hogue, Taylor, Vendance, and Wild Horse. Already America's largest wine company, Gallo, points out that the acquisition accelerates their growth and expands their wine portfolio to every price point from all the American produced brands reportedly retail, though all of the American brands produced retail for $11 or less. These are iconic brands with their categories that resonate with, that resonate with consumers. A Gallo spokesperson told via email, we are excited about the strong presence these brands have, have throughout the US and around the world. We plan to respect the legacy of these brands while devoting our efforts to revitalizing brands and continue to make the highest quality wines. Well, for them, high quality wines includes cutting corners and things like that, because to make wine on a global scale like that is, it's just not an easy thing to do. You have to cut corners, you've got, you've got to, you know. It's like all of a sudden taking your grandmother's apple pie recipe that, 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 that she's been making forever and all of a sudden say, well now grandma, you gotta make a thousand pies. And all of a sudden, instead of throwing two eggs in the, in the bowl, she's throwing 500 eggs in the bowl. And she's now putting a 50-pound bag of flour in there. Now she's buying 10 cases of apples, and she's just trying to figure out how to expand, you know, from one pie to 1,000 pies, or one pie to 500 pies, or even one pie, to 100, one pie to 100 pies is a massive, massive difference. And that's what these companies have to do. If you go to go to Southern now, Southern Glazer, they want to make sure that you have enough production that you're going to be able, they're going to handle um, through the market. You can handle the, their product through the market, or they don't want to have out of stocks. They don't want to have things like that. They want to make sure that you're going to cover their product. So what happens is they have to scramble and up production. Um, and that happens with every single company um, here locally, Tuttletown. They went through that when they were when they sold their sales rights uh, to the Hudson Whiskies, all of a sudden at a certain point, they were like, up production boys, now get a bottling line, no more hand stuff done, get a bottling line, cut employees. Um, you know, what, what you can do to increase production is what you've got to do. And you disregard, you disregard the workforce, you disregard people at that number. Now it's a matter of, it's a numbers game and let's get them out. Let's get the numbers pumped up. So, um, Diageo. Diageo, like I said, was one of the biggest spirit companies, uh, liquor companies uh, in the world until 2017, until China's 
Kalchow, Kalchow Matai, uh, Matau, Matai, on April 9, 2017, um, was overtaken. April 9, 2017, it's a major producer of beer and the biggest Scotch whiskey company. Diageo has the primary listing on the London Stock Exchange. They're a publicly traded company. They've got to honor their shareholders to make the most amount of money. They don't have to honor their employees, they have to honor their shareholders. Um, so some of the brands, some of the brands that Diageo owns, Johnny Walker, Buchanan's, uh, Cardu, uh, Bells, Black and White, White Horse, uh, Kolalaya, uh, Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, Glen, Ch Glen Ch Glen Ch I can't read that, Glen Chinkachia, Dalwini, Cragamore, um, Old Glen, I mean, the list goes on and on here. Windsor, uh, Grand Old Par, uh, on and on. Blair, um, let's see, Glen Spey, a uh, lot of, lot of brands in here. Uh, they own Rowan Company Irish Whiskey, American Whiskies, they own Bullet. People say, oh, Bullet's so good. I never drink Bullet. I will never drink Bullet out because I know that the money's not going to an independent family. It's going to Diageo, which is one of the most corrupt organizations out there. And folks, if you're in the restaurant industry, it takes work to find the small brands. They just don't pop up and show up. It takes it takes work to, to actually find to actually find these. Got another delivery here. It looks like um, Jamie. If you're watching, there's another delivery. Jamie's next door in the office. I'm here at the bar. Um, they own Ciroc. They own Smirnoff. They own Kettle One, Captain Morgan's. Um, and I'm skipping a lot that aren't that they own Bailey's, Don Julio. Uh, Casa Amigos, Gordon's, Tangeray, Ghibli's, uh, Aviation Gin, um, Guinness, Tusker, Harps, Lager, Kilkenny, Senator, Smithwick's. Um, this isn't even their wine that, that Diageo owns. Diageo at one point owned a lot of Bordeaux wines. Um, it was in their portfolio. Um, they sold off in the um, past. How's it going? How's Good. It okay, yep. Let me get uh, somebody to get the sign in the order. I'm just doing a Facebook Live here. She'll be right over. No problem, no problem. She'll be right over. Uh, let's see. So I'm um, just going to click another tab here. All right, so Constellation Brands. Constellation Brands. This is, remember, the big player here. They own Kim Crawford. Miomi, which I used to love Miomi and Pinot Noirs. When they were independent years ago, Miomi, oh, my gosh, awesome Pinot Noirs. The Prisoner. The Prisoner. That is Oren Swift's company that he sold for a lot of money. Um... Prisoner, people love the Prisoner. Prisoner is an awesome wine. It's still a high quality wine. Um, and I'm not saying that they don't make high quality wines, these companies. They just, um, they cut corners wherever they can to be able to produce and keep going. And a lot of these companies will just buy these companies out and they live off of the legacy that the brand had built for 20, 30, 40 years. And then slowly, you know, you don't notice, you don't notice, but sales will drop and go down. And, and over the course of a decade, they sometimes they just destroy the brand. Um, so uh, Charles Smith Wines, Cooper and Thief, Mondavi, Rafino. Rafino is very popular. Um, Rafino, uh, Rafino, especially the Prosecco, is an extremely popular brand. Um, and Rafino Wines. Let's see. Ravage, Dreaming Tree, Mount Veter, Cook's Champagne, Crafters Union, Simi, Spoken Barrel, Schrader, Saved. Uh, let's see, some more brands. The Snitch, Tom Gore, Woodbridge, Woodbridge, which was a Mandavi spinoff. So those are some of the brands that Constellation owns for wines under the spirits. Casa Noble, Svetka, uh, High West Distiller. I used to love High West. We did a lot with High West until they were sold to Constellation. Um, Nelson Green, uh, Micampo. Um, there's just there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, Brand Center, let's see. Um, so, yeah, tons and tons of stuff here. All right, so um, you get the picture. Um, for us... For us, what makes a good wine list is a restaurant that carefully thinks out the wines and not being pushed into buy the big brands and knowing that if you make your list a little different, you will stand out with consumers and make it interesting. And again, I'm not saying some of those wines are bad wines at all. They, they get great ratings. I mean, 
um, the prisoner, um, really awesome. Orange Swift's wine, awesome, but he sold. Now he has a new line. He's back in the wine business and he has, a, he has another wine. That's the wine you wanna be looking for, right? Uh, to make it interesting and, and still support somebody who's independent. I'm not sure if he, he's doing this new brand to, to scale it and stuff like that. Some people, some of these wineries, so some of these business owners have a specific plan to, to build it, scale it, and sell it. Um, so I'm not sure what his, what his new, um, what his new mission is or motive is to, to, to doing wine. After you cash out one time for millions and millions, you might want to do it again. I don't know. I'm not saying that cashing out's a bad thing. I mean, that's the whole American dream, right? Build something and sell it and be able to make money on it and be able to retire on it and have enough money, right? That's the American dream. Um, I love the restaurant here. And, um, but if somebody came here and offered me a lot of money, I'd be like, gee, wow, it's enough money for me to do X, Y, and Z. And that might be, you know, something that I want to look into. So I just wouldn't sell it just to sell it. It would have to be something that's really, you know, saying, like, okay, this is this fits the mission of us going forward. This is helping do something else. So, um, yeah. New oh, good. Stuff. New stuff. Yep, got some new stuff. Oh, Jamie's got some. New... So we got some new breakfast sausages in from Hudson Harvest. Hudson Harvest order just came. That was the next delivery. We had Ace Naturals who just came in, which is an independent health food distributor out of New York, um, unlike United Natural Foods, which I can't stand, uh, UNFI, but I have to still order a few products from UNFI uh, because just they, they stock everything that Whole Foods has. They stock everything that, that I would need, but um, Ace Naturals gives them a good run for their money, and Ace Naturals has some great products. Um, Hudson Harvest just came, which is a local farm hub, so we got these great breakfast sausages. Uh, and these come from um, Sugar Hill Farm over in, has a Hudson Valley logo on there, Hudson Harvest logo. They come from um, Sugar Hill Farm. Are there anything else in there? Got some of those, those um, fruit preserves that I can show off? Yep. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll show those off. So they sent us some sample stuff. They, they're, Hudson Harvest, um, great company, uh, New, uh, Hudson Valley, basically. Oh yeah, we got some more um, Cavatelli from Spofolini. So, um, Jamie's limping over. She did a leg workout. Uh, yesterday, it's killing me. <laughs> She's limping around right now. Um, so, apple pear sauce. Uh, Hudson Harvest apple pear sauce. Uh, apple cinnamon sauce. There's a couple of other ones. A couple other ones. They make this great salsa. Um, let's see. Salsa, green salsa. Where are you? You were, over, you were over here somewhere. It's oh, right. there. It's, it's there. Slow. Okay, so they make this orga organic green salsa, um, certified organic cuts and harvest, all, all local stuff, which is really cool. So all this stuff is all local. Um, yesterday from the other farm hub, we got more of the um, harvest spirits, the Cornelius Applejack, um, the cherry. This cherry stuff is really good. All local stuff. Um, if you ever go to Valencia near Hudson, take, stop in and see um, Harvest Spirits. Derek is an amazing, amazing guy. Um, everything they make comes from their farm. All their apples come from their farm. Uh, the cherries come from New York State. He does a raspberry one from his farm. Uh, the peaches are from him. Mostly everything he puts into the bottle is from him. He's also making some great vinegars. Uh, here's the peach, this peach brandy. Uh, peach Applejack, amazing, amazing stuff. These are all for sale, by the way. These are on our retail shelf here. So if you buy food, you qualify to buy liquor to go. So that's how that is. Um, and our, our um, grocery store, people can uh, make an appointment to come in, or they yep. can come in during our hours. So we open at 5 o'clock most days, 3 o'clock on weekends. You can make an appointment to come in if you wanted to come in earlier, like, hey, I'm in the area at 10 o'clock, and call us, and if we're around, come on in. We'll pack up an order for you. We got lots and lots of cool stuff. More burrata just came in from Italy. It gets flown in every Sunday to Monday. Uh, delivered Tuesday, delivered to us by Wednesday. That's how fresh our burrata is. Every single week we get this amazing burrata from Italy. Um, a lot of people love burrata, but once you switch to the Italian stuff, especially the real deal, the Apulian stuff from Andrea, you'll never go back to the American domestic burrata again. It's just not the same product. I want to do a cooking demo here soon of how an easy way to make burrata um, into a dish. Uh, so I want to do that at some point. That's I'm, I'm going to start doing more cooking. I'm going to start doing cooking videos. I don't do any cooking videos. I'm going to start doing some cooking videos 
um, at the Airbnb that we have now because the kitchen is a beautiful, beautiful kitchen. So we can get a camera there, we can mic me up, and I can do some, some cooking things there, some cooking demos, uh, virtual cooking demos. So, um, the peanut butter, sunflower. The peanut butter, yep. Um, Hudson Harvest, um, we got their ground beef in as well. Um, Hudson Harvest's ground beef. Uh, this is fresh ground beef. This is, um, we're gonna try to make some burgers out of this this week. Uh, so we've, this is our first and, and time getting this. Right? And retail, and retail. This is available retail too. It's one pound, it's local. It's really, really awesome stuff. And it tells you what farm it comes from. Um, Sir William Angus. At Lista Farm, so Hudson again, Hudson Harvest, great, great company. They are very, very strict, um, bringing a lot of local stuff. So, yeah, so I think that's about it. Our ribeye all week is nine ninety nine. That's awesome. Um, but back to the wine list for us. What makes a good wine list for us is a restaurant that searches out the independent brands, that trains their staff, that has somebody on staff to talk about the wines. You know, that can actually. You know, there. I, I don't like. We don't expect all of our staff to know about the wines. Um, they know the basics. You know, they know a few whites, a few reds, uh, the rosé. They know what it tastes like. They can recommend it. They can give you a sample. If somebody needs something more in depth, then I come into the picture. Jamie comes into the picture, and that's easy to do. Um, but a restaurant that has nobody to come into the picture, you know, I just think that's part part of part of a wine list and making a wine list in a restaurant is being able to have somebody there that can that can recommend something to a guest. Um, or be able to at least taste them on something and sample them on something and, and then get their, and figure out what they want. A lot of times people go into a restaurant, they're like, you know, especially here, they're like, well, I'm look, they're looking at the bottles. They're looking at the bottles and like, I want something that's, you know, medium bodied. I want something from Italy. I want something, and we'll just give them a sample of what's by the glass. A lot of people don't think restaurants, a lot of people overlook because for valid reasons, a lot of restaurants have terrible wines by the glass. So they never think of like, well, um, I don't want one of your house wines because I know they're terrible. I want to go to a bottle. And as soon as we taste them on something by uh, one of our house wines by the glass, we're like, wow, this is really, really good. I'm like, well, it's available by the glass. I can get your brand new bottle if you like the bottle or if you can go glass by glass. People are shocked, like, wow, you have that by the glass? That's really great. So uh, for us, the wine list is all about independent brands. Make sure our money is going to the proper place, to a, a family-run winery. Um, so, sorry, my phone's got a bunch of text messages coming in. It's just making sure nothing's important. Um, and that's it. That's it, right, Jamie? Yeah. Open at 5 o'clock today. Burgers are $9.99 today to go. Ribeye steaks, $9.99 to go. And that's it. Folks, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Jamie and I really appreciate all of the support, all the amazing support. So, uh, and that's it. Check out our website for our groceries, aromatimebistro.com, T-H-Y-M-E, aromatimebistro.com. And we'll talk to you later.